All right, guys, welcome to the lecture on cholinergic drugs. This part one of the lecture is going to focus on cholinergic agents, cholinergic stimulants, and then next lecture we'll look at anticholinergic agents. A cholinergic neuron just refers to a neuron that utilizes acetylcholine as its neurotransmitter. There are multiple synapses that utilize acetylcholine as the neurotransmitter. All preganglionic synapses in the autonomic nervous system utilize acetylcholine. It doesn't matter what part of the autonomic nervous system it is. So the parasympathetic nervous system and the sympathetic nervous system, both of them utilize acetylcholine in the presynaptic synapse, the, or the preganglionic synapse. The postganglionic synapse at the effector cell, that's a different story. But all preganglionic synapses in the autonomic nervous system utilize acetylcholine. Um, and then this also includes innervation of the adrenal medulla. Um, the adrenal medulla is innervated and stimulated by acetylcholine. We also have cholinergic synapses in the central nervous system. Um, there are some interneuronal synapses, so from neuron to neuron in the central nervous system that utilize acetylcholine. Um, these are involved in cognition and memory. So we'll see that these cholinergic synapses are important when we talk about Alzheimer's disease and then Alzheimer's treatment as well. The postganglionic synapses of the parasympathetic nervous system utilize acetylcholine. These are cholinergic neurons. So this is where um, the neuron innervates the effector organ in the parasympathetic nervous system. Remember the sympathetic nervous system is utilizing epinephrine and norepinephrine um, in almost every situation. I'll tell you the one caveat in one moment. And then also in the somatic nervous system when we innervate skeletal muscles, they are innervated by cholinergic neurons that utilize acetylcholine. Um, the one caveat of the sympathetic nervous system is post-ganglionic innervation of sweat glands. in the sympathetic nervous system. Um, the sympathetic nervous system innervation of sweat glands utilizes acetylcholine as its neurotransmitter. You guys saw this um, on the lecture where we introduced the autonomic nervous system, but here you guys can see the the levels of innervation in the autonomic nervous system, you can see the neurotransmitter that's used, the receptor that's used, both preganglionic and postganglionic synapses. So here you see the sympathetic nervous system utilizes acetylcholine at its um, ganglionic synapse, and that's binding to nicotinic receptors. And then the postganglionic neuron is utilizing norepinephrine, right, binding to an adrenergic receptor, either alpha or beta. The parasympathetic nervous system is utilizing acetylcholine binding to a nicotinic receptor at the ganglia, and then the postganglionic synapse is again utilizing acetylcholine to bind to a muscarinic receptor. Um, the adrenal medulla again is innervated by a cholinergic neuron that releases acetylcholine binding to a nicotinic receptor. Um, then over here, the somatic nervous system, again there's no ganglia in the somatic nervous system, just the autonomic nervous system. Um, and that's releasing acetylcholine um, to stimulate the skeletal muscle fiber. So you see acetylcholine binding to a nicotinic receptor right, at each of the, gang the preganglionic synapses. At the postganglionic synapses, we see acetylcholine binding to a muscarinic receptor only as part of the parasympathetic nervous system. And then again, the somatic nervous system. 
Here we see the six steps that are involved in the, um, the production, the release, the breakdown and recycling of acetylcholine. So essentially the whole life cycle of acetylcholine, you guys see here. Um, <clears throat> the synthesis of acetylcholine requires acetyl-CoA and choline. You see here at the top that choline is taken up into the neuron by a co-transporter. So it transports two things in the same direction at the same time. Um, this co-transporter transports choline and sodium into the neuron. This is the rate limiting step in the production of acetylcholine. Um, so everything else kind of depends on this step in order to produce acetylcholine. This transport is inhibited, inhibited by hemicholinium. We don't use this therapeutically. Um, it's used in research and experiments, but that's, that's not something that you're gonna be prescribing to your patients um, clinically. So once the choline is taken up into the neuron, um, it is we utilize acetyl-CoA and produce the acetylcholine. Um, the enzyme that's utilized here is choline acetyltransferase. And, and that catalyzes the production of acetylcholine. Once the acetylcholine is produced, um, it's stored in vesicles until it needs to be released. The vesicle just protects it from degradation so it doesn't get broken down. The release of acetylcholine into the synaptic cleft or synaptic gap occurs when an action potential is sent down the axon of the neuron. Okay, so an action potential, this change in voltage is propagated down the length of the axon and it gets to the synaptic terminal or the synaptic bulb. Once the action potential gets down to the synaptic bulb, it changes the voltage of the synaptic terminal, right, of the neuron. That change in voltage opens up voltage-gated calcium channels. When the voltage-gated calcium channels open, calcium rushes into the cell. Remember, there's more calcium outside. So when you open channels, it rushes down its concentration gradient and the calcium enters into the, into the neuron. It's this entry of calcium that triggers the actual uh, release of the acetylcholine into the synaptic cleft. Um, botulinum toxin, or what we utilize clinically called Botox, botulinum toxin inhibits this release of acetylcholine from the synaptic terminal. Okay, so think about that. If you cannot release acetylcholine, right, you cannot stimulate the postsynaptic cell. How do we stimulate skeletal muscles? Acetylcholine, right? So botulinum toxin um, works really well at the neuromuscular junction. It prevents the release of acetylcholine, so you can't stimulate skeletal muscles. So this, um, this creates skeletal muscle paralysis. Systemically, this is dangerous, right? This is deadly systemically. Think about um, if the diaphragm isn't contracting, you're not breathing. However, we can utilize this clinically. Um, Botox, for example, we use aesthetically by paralyzing the muscles in the face, they don't contract, so that decreases the appearance of wrinkles that are present. We do use it off-label as well um, for some other conditions like migraines, for example. Um, spider venom, some spider venom, specifically black widow, spider venom stimulates the release of acetylcholine. So you dump a ton of acetylcholine, which then um, would stimulate the postsynaptic cells. So once this acetylcholine is released into the synaptic um, cleft, the acetylcholine travels and binds to its receptors. Um, there are some presynaptic receptors that it can bind to. Um, we're really going to focus, though, on its binding to postsynaptic receptors, which would be on our target cell, right? our effector cells be a skeletal muscle. When we talk about the parasympathetic nervous system, this could be our effector cells, right? Smooth muscle, glands, etc. 
When the acetylcholine binds to receptors um, on the target cell, this can trigger some sort of an intracellular response. Um, frequently, this opens up sodium channels. Sodium can rush into the cell that can depolarize the cell. Um, what actually happens in the target cell depends on whether the acetylcholine is binding to a nicotinic receptor or a muscarinic receptor and what effector cell that receptor is on. Um, very quickly after the acetylcholine is released, it gets degraded, it gets broken down. The acetylcholine should not sit around for a long period of time unless there's some sort of drug that's involved. Um, the acetylcholine gets broken down by acetylcholinesterase. Okay, acetylcholinesterase, which is also abbreviated ACHE. So acetylcholinesterase breaks down the acetylcholine into choline and acetate. The choline actually gets recycled. Remember at the very beginning, we said that the rate limiting step in the production of acetylcholine um, was the uptake of choline into the neuron. Right? So this choline can come and then be, um, be co-transported into the neuron, recycled into acetylcholine, and the whole cycle repeats itself. Yeah, there are multiple places here where we could see drug targets, right, where drugs could affect this process. Um, <clears throat> we could stimulate or block the release of acetylcholine. We could have drugs that come and bind to the acetylcholine receptor, either to stimulate a response or to block the binding and prevent a response, right, an agonist or an antagonist. We could also affect acetylcholine um, or acetylcholinesterase, right? Acetylcholinesterase block, or breaks down this acetylcholine. So if we got rid of acetylcholinesterase, we're not going to break down acetylcholine. So all of the acetylcholine that gets released can then be utilized. Um, so there are multiple points for drug targets, multiple different types of drugs that we'll talk about that affect this um, cholinergic neuron. Okay, so we'll talk about the two different types of cholinergic receptors. We said that acetylcholine binds to two different types of receptors, nicotinic receptors and muscarinic receptors. Both of these receptors bind to acetylcholine. Um, the difference between them is nicotinic receptors also binds to nicotine, preferentially, um, more so than the muscarinic receptors and muscarinic receptors also bind to muscarine. Um, muscarine is an alkaloid that's in some poisonous mushrooms. Okay, so the muscarinic receptors bind to muscarine, the nicotinic receptors bind to nicotine, the, the difference between them. They both bind to acetylcholine. So we'll start off by talking about the uh, muscarinic receptors. Muscarinic receptors are G-protein coupled receptors. So they are not um, ion channels like the nicotinic receptors are. They are G-protein coupled receptors. There are five subtypes of muscarinic receptors, um, M1, M2, M3, M4, and M5. Um, M1, 2, and 3 are the ones that have been functionally classified, that we understand the difference in their functions. But we do see different um, types of receptors in different locations uh, and in different concentrations. Okay, so muscarinic receptors are located in the parasympathetic nervous system on the effector organs. Okay, so this is not at the ganglia. The presynaptic synapse on the ganglia, that utilizes nicotinic receptors. So in the parasympathetic nervous system, after the ganglia, on the effector organ, when acetylcholine is doing something at the effector organ, it's binding to a muscarinic receptor. So this could be on the heart, this could be smooth muscle um, in, the, um, in the bladder, um, this could be smooth muscle and then the GI tract. These can be our exocrine glands. Um, and then also muscarinic receptors are located in the central nervous system, so in the brain. Drugs that bind to muscarinic receptors, 
preferentially target muscarinic receptors, right? So we have some drugs that are specific for muscarinic receptors, but this is at normal concentrations. A drug that's specific for muscarinic receptors, if you get the concentration high enough, it can also bind to nicotinic receptors. So at really high concentrations, you can negate the selectivity of certain drugs. Um, the mechanism of signal transduction. So what, what actually happens in the cell after the acetylcholine binds. Um, these are G protein coupled receptors, right? So they utilize second messenger systems. When the um, acetylcholine or the drug binds to the muscarinic receptor, this activates some sort of an enzyme inside the cell. And then that enzyme does something and that affects second messengers. And then we have this, this effect inside the cell. Um, M1 and M3 subtypes M1 and M3 subtypes, um, when acetylcholine binds to them, the G protein activates phospholipase C. Um, when acetylcholine binds to M2 receptors, the, the second subtype of muscarinic receptors, G protein activates adenylcyclase. This then creates some sort of a either um, you know, increases, decreases the production of some sort of a second messenger, and this leads to some sort of a response in the cell. Regardless of which enzyme is activated, there are various different intracellular effects that can be carried out. A right? production of DAG, the production of, um, of IP3, right, or inositol triphosphate. Um, there's all different physiological responses that, that can occur once the second messenger system is activated. It just depends on which cell we're in. But you guys already know the cholinergic effects, right? You know what happens in the heart when the cholinergic system is, cholinergic um, neurons are activated. You know what happens in, you know, the bladder. So that's muscarinic receptors. Um, nicotinic receptors are ligand-gated ion channels. Um, again, we refer to them as nicotinic because they also bind to nicotine, which is an alkaloid, again, a plant-based alkaloid, but it's found in um, typically in tobacco. So nicotinic receptors are called nicotinic because they bind to nicotine preferentially. They do also bind to acetylcholine though. Um, these are nicotinic receptors are referred to as ionotropic receptors because they are ligand, ligand gated ion channels, ionotropic because they are ion channels. So binding to them opens up the ion channel. Um, the location of nicotinic receptors are, again, we find them in the brain, so in the central nervous system. Remember, they're also found on the adrenal medulla. So when acetylcholine um, binds to the adrenal medulla gland, that is um, the nicotinic receptors. We also see them at autonomic ganglia. And so all of the presynaptic synapses in the autonomic nervous system, whether it's sympathetic or parasympathetic, utilize nicotinic receptors. And then also at the neuromuscular junction. Okay, so when we stimulate skeletal muscle fibers, acetylcholine is binding to nicotinic receptors. When we look at the signal transdu transduction, again, these are ion channels. So when acetylcholine binds, the ion channel opens. Um, to be specific, two molecules of acetylcholine have to bind in order to induce the conformational change that opens up the ion channel. But when two acetylcholine bind, the ion channel opens. And this happens to allow for the um, diffusion of sodium. And remember, there's more sodium outside the cell. So if you open a sodium channel, sodium is going to flow into the cell. Sodium is positively charged. So when the positive charges go into the cell, that depolarizes the target cell. And I'm sure you guys are all familiar with the way that this happens in skeletal muscles, right? Acetylcholine binds, sodium floods into the cell. That creates an action potential in the muscle, which ends up leading to contraction. Um, now, we said that these nicotinic receptors 
are present um, in the autonomic ganglia um, at the neuromuscular junction, but we do know that there's some sort of a difference between the nicotinic receptors at these different locations. Um, the reason we know that is that different drugs can end up being selective for the nicotinic receptors at the ganglia or at the neuromuscular junction. So you can give the same drug and it can selectively block just the neuromuscular junction or just the autonomic ganglia. So there must be some difference between the receptors. Um, <clears throat> Metamelamine selectively blocks nicotinic receptors at the autonomic ganglia. Atricurium selectively blocks nicotinic receptors at the neuromuscular junction. Okay, so there can be some specificity to either stimulating or blocking these nicotinic receptors. Um, also interesting, just talking about nicotine itself, at low concentrations, nicotine stimulates nicotinic receptors, but at high concentrations, it can actually block the receptor. So effects can be different with nicotine, um, whether you're at a low concentration or a really high concentration. Direct cholinergic agonists mimic the action of acetylcholine by binding to cholinergic receptors. Um, the direct cholinergic agonists can be broken up into two groups, choline esters and the naturally, naturally occurring alkaloids. Um, the naturally occurring alkaloids include nicotine, which we mentioned before, and pilocarpine. The choline esters include acetylcholine itself, which we do give acetylcholine solution, um, carbacol, bethanicol, methacholine, and then um, sevamoline. The rest of these tend to have a longer duration than acetylcholine. Acetylcholine is broken down really rapidly by acetylcholine esterase. So adjusting something in the structure of the drug can decrease its degradation and then increase its duration of action, which is helpful. Um, a problem with these though, is that the majority of them lack selectivity and they bind to receptors indiscriminately. So acetylcholine, for example, imagine if you gave acetylcholine intravenously and you have acetylcholine all over the body, binding to nicotinic receptors and muscarinic receptors, you're gonna be causing cholinergic stimulation all over the place. So if it lowers heart rate, lowers contractility, decreases cardiac output, can cause hypotension, can cause bronchoconstriction, um, in the eye contract the ciliary muscle for near vision, contract the pupillary constrictor for meiosis, um, secretions, right? So salivation, lacrimation, contraction of the detrusor muscle in the bladder, GI contraction and secretion, just effects all over the place and that's really messy. That's not the way we, we really want to treat any conditions. So a couple ways to get around that are to use agents that have selectivity, right? That bind to a specific one of the receptors or bind at specific locations. Um, or we can just use the medication locally. And this is what we do um, frequently, for example, like in the eye, um, if we want to cause ciliary muscle contraction or um, or meiosis, we can utilize the drugs as eye drops. And that helps to limit some of those systemic side effects that might occur. Um, carbacol, for example, carbacol binds as well, just like acetylcholine, carbacol binds to both types of receptors. It is beneficial because the carbacol has a longer duration of action than acetylcholine. So that's helpful pharmaceutically, um, but again, it binds to both types of receptors, so it would cause a lot of systemic side effects. Um, the way that we would get around this, again, is to utilize carbocol in the eye, um, utilize it locally. Um, so we'll talk about um, pilocarpine coming up in a second in detail. We'll talk about bethanicol in detail. Um, Sevemeline does show some specificity. Um, so we do use it clinically to increase salivary secretions. And we can use pilocarpine for this as well. Um, but to treat symptoms of dry mouth or xerostomia, 
Um, that's dry mouth, and dry mouth can be a big problem. Um, dry mouth is common in that's a J S J O Jorn's syndrome, which is actually an autoimmune disease. Um, it's associated with a lot of dry mouth, a really severe dry mouth. So we can use pilocarpine here, um, but salvimaline has been shown to have some specificity, specificity and be able to increase salivary secretions um, and lacrimal secretions because of its specificity for muscarinic receptors in the area without having as many systemic side effects. Um, methacholine, methacholine, is utilized to test for asthma. Um, remember that cholinergic stimulation causes bronchoconstriction. So we utilize methacholine and, um, and measure the amount of bronchoconstriction and utilize that to diagnose asthma. Bethanicol is a direct cholinergic agonist um, that has a strong selectivity for muscarinic receptors, especially in the bladder and the GI tract, the smooth muscle in the bladder and the GI tract. It stimulates GI motility, which is useful in neurogenic atony and megacolon. Um, and then it stimulates detrusor muscle contraction, which the detrusor muscle is in the wall of the bladder and then urethral sphincter relaxation. These two things, contracting the bladder and relaxing the urethral sphincter, stimulate urination. So we use bethanicol to stimulate an atonic bladder. Atonic, like no tone. Um, this is utilized for urinary retention postpartum and postoperative urinary retention. So after you have a baby or after an operation, they normally make you go pee, right, before you're able to leave. Um, and bethanicol can be used to stimulate this. It's quick. It has a short duration of action of about an hour. Um, and it can kind of get things going. It's important to know here this says non-obstructive urinary retention. You don't want to stimulate um, contraction of the bladder when there's something obstructing the outflow. Adverse effects of bethanicol are generalized cholinergic effects. Um, muscarinic receptors are located at effectors all over the body. So while, we, um, while we're using this for the effects in the bladder and the GI tract, it is there, it still does stimulate. Uh, muscarinic receptors in other areas. So there are general cholinergic side effects. So sweating, salivation, flushing, um, a decrease in blood pressure. Uh, this is constrained this reflex tachycardia because we tend to think of cholinergic as decreasing the heart rate. But sometimes when the blood pressure decreases so much, the body responds to that with reflexive um, increase in heart rate to try and um, combat that blood pressure decrease. So sometimes there can be a, um, a tachycardia or an increased heart rate seen with it. Um, diarrhea, bronchospasms, some of this is just annoying. Um, so like sweating, salivation, diarrhea, it's just annoying. However, um, if the cholinergic response or cholinergic effects are too, uh, or there's too much of them or they are in um, areas that could be life-threatening, so severe cardiovascular effects, right, a bottoming out of blood pressure, um, or severe respiratory effects, um, respiratory effects, severe bronchospasm, atropine can be administered to reverse that or to overcome that. We'll talk about atropine, atropine a lot. Atropine is acts all over the body, um, and it's like an opposite for all of the cholinergic agonists. Whatever the cholinergic agonist is doing, atropine combats that. So we'll see atropine come up a lot when we talk about um, overcoming these cholinergic responses in the case of the toxicities. Pilocarpine is another muscarinic agonist. 
Um, <clears throat> it's uncharged, so it can cross the blood-brain barrier. It does penetrate into the central nervous system, which is important when we talk about um, the possibility of toxicity and how to combat that toxicity. Um, but it's a muscarinic agonist. It can be given um, systemically or topically. When we're utilizing it for the eye, we give it topically, so via solution, an eye drop into the eye. Um, and we utilize pilocarpine in the eye to cause meiosis. Um, for example, like during some sort of eye procedure, um, we utilize it to cause ciliary muscle contraction. And this opens the trabecular meshwork and allows for the outflow of fluid to decrease intraocular pressure. Um, it is a potent stimulator of secretions, so it increases salivation. It increases lacrimation, which we'll see that we can utilize therapeutically. Um, but it does this at all different locations, right? It, it um, increases secretions at all different effectors. It's not selective just for the salivary or lacrimal secretions. So utilizing it systemically is associated with side effects. Um, and again, it does penetrate the central nervous system as well. Um, <clears throat> therapeutic uses of pilocarpine. Pilocarpine is the drug of choice for the emergency lowering of intraocular pressure in both types of glaucoma. So when someone presents to the emergency room or someone presents um, with dangerously high intraocular pressure, the drug of choice is pilocarpine. Um, it works in minutes. works in minutes and it can be repeated. So um, again, drug of choice for emergency lowering of intraocular pressure. It can also be used chronically for glaucoma. The drops last hours, um, between four to eight hours, the duration of action. So it can be used regularly on a daily basis for glaucoma. Um, it's also used to reverse the mydriasis of atropine. So atropine drops cause mydriasis. Um, atropine and pilocarpine are opposites. So uh, pilocarpine can be given to reverse that, that dilation of the eye. We can give pilocarpine orally to, again, increase salivation um, in xerostomia. Xerostomia, again, is just dry mouth. Dry mouth can be present post-radiation treatment. Um, so if somebody is post-radiation and has chronic severe dry mouth, pilocarpine tablets can be given. Um, also, we mentioned Sjorn syndrome. Um, Sjorn syndrome has a decreased salivation and decreased lacrimation or tear production. Pilocarpine would stimulate both of those. Um, but again, it's, it's not selective for only those areas. So it's going to be increasing, um, increasing sweating, increasing GI secretions, GI motility, et cetera. Side effects of pilocarpine, I mean, it, it varies based on whether you're giving it locally or systemically, obviously. Um, locally, if you're giving just pilocarpine eye drops um, or a phthalmic solution, Side effects can be things like blurred vision, night blindness, um, brow ache. If you're giving it systemically, then you can have more systemic side effects, right? The whole cholinergic response systemically. Um, pilocarpine poisoning presents with just an exaggeration of all of the peripheral nervous system effects. Okay, so an exaggeration of cholinergic effects, that bloods. Um, <clears throat> so diaphoresis, diaphoresis is sweating. is salivation, diarrhea. Um, <clears throat> the treatment for pilocarpine toxicity is atropine. So treatment of toxicity is atropine. Um, and atropine at doses, 
that will cross the blood brain barrier. Because remember, pilocarpine does penetrate into the central nervous system. Not all cholinergic agonists do. Uh, here, this is the kind of a nice way to remember the adverse effects of cholinergic agonists. Um, again, it's just an exaggeration, really, of the cholinergic response or the response of the um, parasympathetic nervous system. So SLUD is the, the kind of classic way to remember these. Salivation, lacrimation, urination, defecation. And I always call it the wet stuff. Um, sweat, drool, pee, poop, right? Stuff is just coming out everywhere. Bloods is a new way to remember that. Bloods, this is just um, all of the respirates adding bradycardia. Bradycardia, remember, is just an increased heart rate. So decreased heart rate, which would also result in a decreased cardiac output, um, can, re can result in a decrease in blood pressure. Um, that B, you could also add bronchoconstriction to that. Okay, so bradycardia, bronchoconstriction, lack formation, urination, defecation, salivation. This is just a comparison of the different structures of some of the cholinergic agonists. Here you see um, acetylcholine itself. Okay. These um, bethanical and carbocol, both of these are... Um, just um, esters of acetylcholine, they resist hydrolysis from acetylcholine esterase. So what would that tell you about them? Right? They resist the breakdown from acetylcholine esterase. They still bind at acetylcholine receptors, but acetylcholine esterase um, does not hydrolyze them as well. So because of that, they would have an increased duration of action right versus acetylcholine this is pilocarpine what do you notice about that pilocarpine right off the bat right off the bat i see rings um and rings are generally nonpolar right so looking at a structure that's nonpolar something that's nonpolar tells me that it's going to cross into the central nervous system pretty easily um, which we said it does, right? It does cross into the central nervous system. I don't see any charges on that at all. Whereas the others, look, there's a charge, there's a charge, there's a charge. Um, so that, that, that CNS penetration is important for when we're dosing a medication. So the drugs that we just spoke about, bethanacol, carbocol, pilocarpine, those are direct cholinergic agonists. They bind to acetylcholine receptors, and that's how they stimulate the cholinergic response. Indirect acting cholinergic agonists also stimulate a cholinergic response, but they don't bind to cholinergic receptors. The way that the indirect cholinergic agonists work is by inhibiting acetylcholinesterase. So you have your neuron and your target cell. Your neuron releases acetylcholine, it binds to a receptor, right? And that stimulates some sort of a response. In the synaptic cleft, we have acetylcholinesterase just waiting to break down this acetylcholine. The other drugs that we spoke about come in and they bind to these receptors and they stimulate a response. And they also resist the breakdown from acetylcholine esterase. So they stimulate a response typically longer than acetylcholine would. These indirect drugs, they don't come and bind to these receptors. What these indirect drugs do is they inhibit this acetylcholine esterase. So whatever acetylcholine that gets released from this, this ner presynaptic neuron, that acetylcholine stays available for longer. So you have a greater cholinergic response at all synapses that utilize acetylcholine because the acetylcholine esterase has been inhibited. There's not going to be breakdown of the endogenous acetylcholine. 
Um, so this could be in the central nervous system, right? We have interneuron, inter, um, neuronal synapses that utilize acetylcholine. This could be at neuromuscular junctions, um, or this could be in the autonomic nervous system. So we can utilize these for lots of different conditions. Now, acetylcholinesterase inhibitors can be reversible or irreversible. The reversible cholinesterase inhibitors are things that we use clinically. We'll see, we can use these for myasthenia gravis. We can use these, um, we can use these for Alzheimer's. The irreversible cholinesterase inhibitors are toxic. We do not use these clinically. Um, the government developed these as nerve agents. So sarin gas, for example, was developed um, echothiophate for um, like chemical warfare, toxic, deadly. Um, we also use these as pesticides. So there are some organophosphate pesticides like parathion, malathion, that are irreversible cholinesterase inhibitors. Again, the ones that we use clinically are reversible. Edrophonium is a cholinesterase inhibitor that is really short acting. Um, it has really rapid renal elimination. So it's only active for like 10 to 20 minutes. Um, and it's also peripherally active. It's a quaternary amine. Um, it has a charged nitrogen. So it does not cross the blood-brain barrier. It's only active out in the periphery. We um, utilize edrophonium not for treatment. It's, it's just too short-acting to utilize for treatment. We would have to dose it like constantly around the clock. But we use it in the diagnosis of a condition called myasthenia gravis. Myasthenia gravis uh, includes or, or occurs because of the autoimmune destruction of nicotinic receptors at the neuromuscular junction. So the neuromuscular junction is skeletal muscles. Okay, so you have your cholinergic neuron, your gap, and then your skeletal muscle with nicotinic receptors. Right, and normally you've got a bunch of nicotinic receptors here. So whenever acetylcholine is released, all right, some of that binds to receptors, stimulates contraction in the skeletal muscle. Acetylcholinesterase destroys the acetylcholine and everything goes back to normal. Well, in myasthenia gravis, these receptors get destroyed. So when acetylcholine is released, the muscle does not get stimulated very much, right? So this, um, with myasthenia gravis, there's muscle weakness, progressive, muscle weakness and fatigue. We can use edrophonium um, to diagnose myasthenia gravis. You give edrophonium and then when the neuron fires, this acetylcholine that's present does not get broken down. So there's a lot more acetylcholine present in the synaptic gap. So the acetylcholine can bind to whatever the nicotinic receptors are left. And there's a, a great increase in muscle strength really rapidly if the person has myasthenia gravis. Okay, so this is a way that we can diagnose it. We treat myasthenia gravis with other cholinesterase inhibitors that are longer, um, have a longer duration of action. Um, cholinergic crisis can occur if the drug builds up, if there's excess drug present, um, and you just look for cholinergic, um, a cholinergic response. The antidote for this would be our antidote for like everything cholinergic, and that is atropine. Physostigmine is another reversible acetylcholine um, or acetylcholinesterase inhibitor. So this increases acetylcholine 
that's present at cholinergic synapses. Um, physostigmine is not charged. It's a tertiary amine, not quaternary. Um, so it is not charged. Because of that, it's active peripherally and centrally. Right? So it can cross the blood-brain barrier into the central nervous system. Physostigmine has effects everywhere. It has a really wide range of effects. We just said it crosses into the brain. Um, so it has central nervous system effects. It um, increases acetylcholine in the autonomic nervous system synapses. It increases it at the neuromuscular junction. So it has increase of cholinergic effects really everywhere. Um, it's intermediate acting. It's not so short. Um, it's not so short acting. It's between 30 minutes and about two hours. We utilize physostigmine to treat anticholinergic overdoses. Um, really, that's it. The side effects would just be too much um, to use it therapeutically for anything else, but we can utilize it as an antidote for anticholinergic overdoses. That's for any anticholinergic, okay? Even anticholinergics that uh, enter the central nervous system, right? So physostigmine can be used for an atropine, overdose, for example. Side effects of physostigmine are everything cholinergic, right? So the whole blood thing. Um, it causes contraction of GI smooth muscle, bradycardia, hypotension, myosis, um, skeletal muscle twitches. At high doses, it can cause convulsions. Um, it can also end up causing paralysis because of constant depolarization at the neuromuscular junction. Neostigmine um, is another acetylcholinesterase, acetylcholinesterase inhibitor with an intermediate um, duration of action. However, neostigmine does not enter the central nervous system. It does not cross the blood-brain barrier. It's charged, so it is only peripherally active. Okay, the physostigmine um, enters the CNS. Neostigmine does not. So neostigmine is a bit more um, selective in its areas that it works. Um, neostigmine is used to reverse the effects of neuromuscular blockers post-surgery. So if a neuromuscular blocker is used during surgery to uh, prevent any contraction, after surgery, neostigmine can be used to uh, reverse that blockade. Um, but remember, neostigmine does not enter the central nervous system, right? So it cannot be used as an antidote for centrally active anticholinergics. So for example, that would be like atropine. Okay, neostigmine will not reverse the effects of atropine because neostigmine is not going to enter into the central nervous system. Neostigmine is used um, as a medication for symptomatic management for myasthenia gravis. Um, so not just for diagnosis, but it is a bit longer acting, so it can be used to help treat muscle weakness in myasthenia gravis. Um, neostigmine can also be used to stimulate urinary motility, urinary contractions, um, as well as GI motility. However, it is contraindicated if there is any urinary or bowel obstruction. And any of these that are gonna stimulate motility in the urinary tract and GI tract are gonna be contraindicated if there's some sort of obstruction present. Side effects, again, are just cholinergic side effects. Um, so bloods. Pyridostigmine. Pyridostigmine um, is similar to neostigmine. Um, it's a reversible acetylcholinesterase inhibitor. Um, it's used for chronic symptomatic management of myasthenia gravis. Um, same cholinergic um, side effects are present. Um, pyridostigmine does not enter into the central nervous system. It's, it's pretty similar to neostigmine except that it has a longer duration of action. Okay, so that makes it um, easier to come up with a dosing regimen when you're using it for chronic treatment of myasthenia gravis.
Finally, reversible cholinesterase inhibitors can be utilized for Alzheimer's disease. Um, Alzheimer's disease is associated with decreased cholinergic neurons in the central nervous system. So there's decreased cholinergic activity in the CNS. This is responsible for the decrease in um, cognitive function and memory in Alzheimer's disease. We can give cholinesterase inhibitors that are centrally active um, in order to increase cholinergic activity in the central nervous system. This slows the progression of Alzheimer's disease um, pretty moderately. It's not a huge impact we've seen, um, and there has not been evidence of cost effectiveness, but when patients are in that position, um, the people and families tend to be grasping at straws. So um, these acetylcholinesterase inhibitors are what we utilize to try and slow the progression and to preserve as much brain function as possible. Um, again, these are acetylcholinesterase inhibitors that have to have CNS penetration in order to be active in the brain. Um, Donepazil, rivastigmine, and galantamine are the um, ACHE inhibitors that we use. Donepazil or Aricept tends to be the most frequently prescribed. Tacrin. Tacrin was the first of these that we used for Alzheimer's, but Tacrin is associated with hepatotoxicity. Okay, so we don't use it because of that. Okay, so genepazil, rivastigmine, and galantamine have much better side effect profiles. Um, most side effects that they're associated with are GI side effects, so nausea, diarrhea, lack of appetite, um, they can also be associated with syncope and then other um, cholinergic side effects, but GI distress is the most common of these. All right, that is it. Um, part two of the lecture will be posted um, next week, and part two of the lecture will cover anticholinergic.